The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast, episode five. You sound so erudite the way you say it like that. Welcome. Come into our fine dining restaurant. Thank you. I was actually once angling for a gig as a telephone operator where my voice would be recorded and thousands of people would call up and press really? two to speak to a live representative. For real? I didn't get the job. Oh, my first job in L.A. was I uh, had to answer the phone at this uh, at this uh, corporate staffing um, place called Source Services. Mm. And everyone who answered the phone when I started would say, Source Romac, can I help you? But I was told by the office manager, a very cool guy named Paul, very nice guy, not not saying anything negative about him. But on my first day, he said, no, when you answer the phone, I want you to say, thank you for calling Source Services, a business of Romac International. This is Ben. How can I help you? That's a mouthful. And I had to say it. And I know this because one of my jobs was to print out how many calls I answered. I had to say it like 500 times a day. I got to say that nothing annoys me more than when I call up like a bank or Quiznos or anything and they have to go through a you know 30 second descriptor of who they are what the business is before they will actually talk to me but I think this does pertain to what we're about to talk to which is about professionalism so when uh when Paul gave me that mouthful I have we've all called places where they answer the phone you know like you just don't know (laughs) but like I'm the son of a radio guy Mm. my father is a radio announcer and so I 500 times a day as obnoxiously as I possibly could, I would answer the phone every time. Thank you for calling Source Services, a business of Romac International. This is Ben. How can I help you? Thank you for calling Source Services. <laughs> People thought I was a recording. <laughs> they did, huh? People wow. really, for real, thought well, I was a recording. You rehearsed it. You practiced it. You spent time at home doing yeah. that, you know, so that you could give the perfect delivery. It was important to me that if my job was to say, this mouthful (laughs) thank you for calling source services a business of romac international this is ben how can i help you it was very important to me that i actually put something into it you know i think that's actually wonderful that you were so committed to your job and that you tried to even though you had to say this lousy terrible mouthful of stuff you tried to say it the best way you possibly could you tried to say it in a way that sounded exactly what they wanted a recording yes exactly and they loved me and uh when I was able to quit, they were sad. And I ran into one of them because they were at the building where my bank used to be. And one of them was like, if you're looking for work, man, we can use you back again. <laughs> well, you know, there's something to be said, though, because there's an awful lot of people who think that it's OK just to phone that shit in. Yeah. They just want to phone it in. They want to phone in. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I worked with as a professional cameraman on set who phoned in their day to day job. Now, how do you phone it in as a cameraman? I mean, like, it's obvious well, to everybody that you're phoning it in. I- I'd like to think. Then it's obvious, but I, I worked with some people who would be up all night. They would not have had a decent night's sleep and uh, by choice because they would go out and party or do whatever. And they'd show up the next day and they'd just be a wreck. But that was OK because they could kind of fake it. They'd be loud and point their fingers and say, ah, I'm of those cases over here. So those are the DPs. Uh, yeah, ACs so, too? Uh, uh, was, uh, operators mostly. Actually. Operators. <laughs> But, you know, uh, operators, they like to live hard, play hard. So. Yeah, yeah. And you get like those guys who wanted extra extra jiggly hand- handheld. You get the guy who was up all night, you know, drinking tequila shots. I would like to say that didn't usually happen, but that did happen. Because I think that for some people, like, you know, the choice was surgeon. And surgeon, probably not a good idea to be like doing tequila shots all night good before point. big surgery. But camera operating, it's like, mm, maybe you'll drift a little bit to the left and everything will be okay. Well, like so. all the first movies that I ever got to work on were in uh, Mobile, Alabama. Mm. And uh, they always put us up at this Radisson near the battleship, Alabama, mm. right off the 10, the same 10 that we have here in LA. That is the transcontinental freeway. It is. So there was a bar there called Kimberly's mm. and one of the shows that I worked on, the crew ran up, I believe it was a $50,000 bar tab. Wow. Because they would just go get pissed drunk every night after the shoot. Maybe we should just go into phoning it in because like some people can phone it in and maybe not camera people are the right people who phone it in. But I mean, I'm sure you worked with people who phoned it in. 
Oh God. Yeah. No, I've worked with uh, pretty much every crew position I could imagine, including directors who've phoned it in. Uh, I think it's really interesting though, that there's this whole market now that or a perceived market because there's some people who've been doing this for, let's just say a short period of time, maybe a year, two years, three years. They've had a couple of shorts on YouTube. They believe that they're now qualified to start teaching other people how to make movies. Hey, and why not? And, and maybe they are, maybe if you just need to learn, you know, what it's like to make something on YouTube. Although, uh, I don't know. You, you tell me, uh, you recently told me about a, how to make a horror film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the I'm trying to remember. I actually posted it on Twitter and got a couple retweets cause it was hilarious, but it was like this video on how to make a horror movie. And it was like replete with cheesy library music. And this guy being like, you know, horror movies are about not showing things, but it's like this guy would show up in front of a green screen and then explain I, I hate to be like this. One of my favorite podcasts is uh, Script Notes with John August and Craig Mazin, and they always go off on anyone who will tell you how you can write a screenplay. And I feel that way about a horror movie. Like I feel like the people who are amazing at making horror movies, like you couldn't reduce George Romero or Stuart Gordon or Eli Roth even. You you can't reduce these people to like a checklist of like, oh, is the bad guy out of focus? Oh, okay, well then then you're good. Or, oh, is it handheld now? Is he looking off screen? Is it, it makes me so mad that somebody would do that. And I'm watching it and I'm like, so like if I follow your rules, what film would I even make? Like who knows what kind of movie I would, <laughs> I mean, it's stupid. You'd make something great for YouTube. That, <laughs> you know, had a little disclaimer that don't let your kids watch this. It's a horror movie. It's creepy. Uh, well, I caught five minutes of something online the other day that, you know, it was filled with so many technical inaccuracies. And I then had to Google who the, the host of this paid, oh, no. this, this paid, uh, you know, film course, film lecture, how to make your movie and, you know, 18 uh, easy hours or whatever it was. And I looked uh, it up and they had four, they had four YouTube shorts to their credit. And, oh, uh, well. and I was like, okay, well I understand maybe this is why it's $99. Maybe, you know, they just thought they could phone it in. Maybe they thought they're they getting could. paid like $25 per YouTube short. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, and that's basically what it came down to. It's like, I kind of remember, I mean, there's people who make their entire living out of these short course, pack a bunch of information in. Yeah. Dove S.S. Simmons. Of might, course. Maybe, Dove, maybe. I was going to say Dove Simmons. <laughs> that guy's been doing it since like the 1960s, right? I knew someone who used to be like his teacher's assistant when he came to San Francisco and he'd always get all fired up. And every time, you know, the, the class would end, he'd be like, I'm going to make a movie. I'm going to make a feature. And uh, he did eventually do that. But I don't think he followed most of the Dove S.S. Simmons lessons. One of them was... Dove used to tell people that you could make a feature film for $5,000. And then the caveat was it was a 35 millimeter feature film, but it was all one take. <laughs> Essentially one take as much as possible. Did he so like, spawn enough uh, one take uh, films? I don't know anyone who actually tried to do this, but he was like, you can get a deal for this amount of stock and this amount of processing and you'll just do <sighs> the whole thing in one take. And it was, but it would all be short end. So it would be one 15 second take. Or, no, well, one or oh, oh, one take per shot. Yeah, like one take per scene. And, and it was like, and that was it, and that was the whole thing. But David Leitner, I know we mentioned it on the last episode, but I almost want to bring him back if he's in town and just do like a mini episode that's him and I debating Final Cut Pro Ten. I bet he would do it because he is a supreme supporter of that uh, yeah. program. And he's a smart cookie. And look, man, I'm not here to say if Final Cut Pro 10 really, you know, Rogers your Hammerstein that you shouldn't use it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, I think I still I think I stole that from Futurama. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you're going to steal, you might as well steal from the best. Yeah. I mean, if it works for you, then then good for you. And they've been constantly making improvements on it. But I still look at it and I'm like, nah, I'm good. I think Premiere where I've landed is about about the level that I, I prefer to work at hmm. but anyway but we had we had a, a great debate right before we started recording because it's like well it's a cinematography podcast it's not an editing podcast but what the fuck I think we should be able to talk about anything I mean I think cinematography doesn't exist in a vacuum it needs editorial to actually work well and also I think that we're in an era now where editing is part of cinematography now like at, absolutely at, you know like color correction is uh, George Foyt who I'm hoping to get on the podcast he's the guy who shot 20 seconds to live George is a phenomenal colorist and he, mm. co- he color corrects everything he does. And I'm like, that to me is kind of the future of cinematographers. I feel, and, and we actually get into this with David about shouldn't cinematographers, if they're going to be the author of the look of the film, shouldn't they be enabled to color correct all their stuff? And, and I think I bring up in the interview, don't you think it behooves them to learn how, you know? And he's like, well, yeah, but now they're expecting DPs to go in and spend 
you know, hours and hours and hours coloring stuff and they're not going to pay for it. That's true. There's um, some productions which just don't want to shell out the money for the DP to supervise that. But if the DP doesn't go to the do the color sessions then there's a good chance they don't end up with what they were hoping and well i guess my argument is dps should learn how to use davinci resolve it's free that you can get the free version it's fully functional at the free version level and some dps are fabulous luddites and they're never going to learn how to how to do something like that and i actually think that for the level of work that they're doing they probably never need to of course i think that perhaps younger dps and people just starting out now should have a basic understanding of what is possible and what's not possible in color correction i don't think that a dp also needs to be a colorist or needs to know how to turn every knob i don't think that's required but they should know what's possible because it'll make them a better shooter they'll be able to then uh, know hey i can't quite get to where i want to here on set but i know that i have the ability when i get into post to make these adjustments yeah i I guess well and david and i discussed this my feeling is that i mean i think that um one of the reasons i learned how to edit i would have told you at the time that it was because i was tired of paying people to use an avid or you know a media 100 at the time (laughs) because I'm old (laughs) I was tired of paying for it but really it was like I wanted to be in control of the final message and I it's not that I don't see what a great editor brings to a project but for like 95% of what I do I know exactly how it needs to be cut and I don't need an intermediary to do that and I think that for DPs if they knew how to use DaVinci which is not even though it's owned by a company called Black Magic it's not Black Magic if <laughs> I think black magic would dare to disagree with you. It is. It is a black magic product that is not uh, achieved through sorcery. Fair okay. enough. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> now, now I understand. It's, it, <laughs> it's not literally the term. Magic. Yes, okay, exactly. Yes, gotcha. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's something that at least they can learn kind of the basics of. And yeah, if you're doing like a high end car commercial or something, you're going to go to one of those houses that does the highest, highest end. But, um, you know, there's some basics to color correction that pretty much anyone can pick up. And I'm kind of in awe of George Foyt and his ability to color correct pretty much everything he does. And he it's like he shoots it knowing what he's going to achieve with it. And, uh, you know, he was using color and now he's moving more into a Da Vinci world because he can he can use that stuff. Uh, I remember back when uh, the camera tests were going on for Benjamin Button and I went out to the set a few times to meet with uh, Claudio Miranda and. Uh, David Fincher and to see what the process was for them to set their looks because they were evaluating uh, they were evaluating the the Dalsa 4K camera and also the yeah. uh, Thompson Viper film stream. Isn't, didn't they use the Viper? They did end up using the Viper on the production and uh, Claudio Miranda had a piece of software open. I want to say it was Lightroom, but it might have been Aperture. It might have been Aperture. And um, I don't think Lightroom existed back probably then. Probably wasn't Lightroom then. It must have been Aperture. And uh, he was setting looks in that software. And granted, this is not, you know, color grading software, but he'd take a, a still frame yeah. and could say, like, you know, this is what I'm trying to go for. And he'd drop those individual frames onto a thumb drive and it would get handed off to a colorist. And the colorist would match everything that he created. Boom, right there. Yeah. The set. No, you can do that. Uh, I, I thought that I thought that was a, it was a very cool way to work. I'd never seen anyone uh, who was a DP who had so embraced the you know digital formats, and we did the same sort of thing with the Dalsa camera, but uh, we had different pieces of software. But he would take those you know DPX files, load them into Aperture, and then boom, set a grade, and then say this is what I want to look like, and then that would go back to post production, and then that's how they would work. That's pretty smart. I'd never seen it done before, and now I see more of that being done, and it's very interesting because. Um, there's this new thing that's been talked about for a long time called ACES. It's the Academy of Motion Pictures, uh, Arts and Sciences methodology along with ASC to create a seamless look from set all the way through post-production and so that every monitor is always showing you exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it goes kind of beyond just a simple series of LUTs. But uh, anyway, it'll be very interesting because there are new products that are coming out that take advantage of that. And um, there's been a lot of resistance to it initially, but I've heard that it could very well be uh, the, the way that everyone starts working in the near future because oh. there's such broad support for it. So we'll, we'll definitely have someone who knows a lot about ACEs come talk on the show at some point. That's good. So we'll, can, they'll probably bury us with technical uh, jargon that'll you know what, alienate half the audience. It's possible to describe all of it in lay terms that people <laughs> understand. But this is the Cinematography Podcast. And if sometimes not- a mommy and a daddy like to make a movie together. <laughs> and when they do, sometimes they want the highlights to not burn out. This is not... The, the, this is not the adult cinematography podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the uh, 
the truth of the matter is, is that you have to be part plumber sometimes. You can't just be all artist to be a DP oh, or a yeah. cinematographer. And some of the stuff is, is plumbing. We have to, you know, attach a couple of, you know, three quarter inch pipes to the one inch pipes here. And you got to have the right brass fitting. Otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't talk about plumbing. Let's, well, let's, and let's, you shouldn't talk about fittings after what you did to our <laughs> microphone stand. No one needs to know about the microphone stand. <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem with being a tinkerer. So David Leitner, tell me, uh, how, did, how did you get to know David Leitner? I met David Leitner at Sundance in 2010. I was uh, staying in a house right off of uh, Main Street there, and a mutual friend of ours said, oh, you know, you should really meet David Leitner. And as a matter of fact, he's dining at that table directly across from where we're sitting. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, David, come on over here. And then uh, we talked for a couple of minutes, and David had already known about me and the stuff that I was doing with uh, putting peel mounts on DSLR cameras. And he was very, very interested to see them in, in person. He was at, at Sundance with a movie. Uh, he'd produced a movie that was uh, uh, premiering there, I believe. And uh, we spent a long time talking about technology and I got to meet the uh, director of the movie that he produced. And he was doing some writing for, I want to say... I want to say it was a website or maybe man, he is a smart cookie, man. He really is kind of like a, you know, you hear Jack of all trades, but it's like he, he is a cinematographer. He's a producer. He founded a film festival for documentaries. He, (laughs) he's, he's worked with huge documentarians like Frederick Wiseman, which impresses the shit out of me. You you don't meet a lot of people who actually can do all those things and pull off all of those things. That's what makes, that's what makes David so unique. And he's a technologist as well. He is. He, I, I see him at NAB, you know, uh, Sony pulls him out and has him talk, you know, extemporaneously for 30 minutes about their products and all kinds of things. And, uh, he really has it down. You know, he doesn't open his mouth unless he's really got, he really knows. And if he doesn't know, he'll say, but he really knows what he's, what he's talking about. Well, I still disagree with him about Final Cut Pro 10 and that's where I'm going to leave it. But (laughs) here he is. David Leitner. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm here at Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California with David Leitner, DP, director, and producer of both narrative and documentary features. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Because what we're talking about a lot of times is we're using the camera to tell a story. And if you're saying that you're not you're not seeing it in kind of the typical three act structure, the way that a lot of people do stuff in Hollywood, what structure, if a structure, do you see in the stuff that you do? Well, I think first I have to explain the kind of work that I've done through the years. I backed into cinematography. I was a kid from Appalachia who went to an Ivy League college, had seen almost no films in his life. First three nights at Cornell University, and this is quite some time ago, and Cornell had a very famous film screening series. I saw La Strada, I saw uh, The Informer by John Ford, and I saw Exterminating Angel by Luis Bunuel. And I realized I'd landed on a different planet. Now, I'd gone to Cornell, and I was going to study math and physics and maybe dabble in chemistry. Chemistry was a dying science at that time. And I wound up graduating in psychology because Cornell in those days didn't offer any sort of a major in film or filmmaking. However, they had a a brilliant film history teacher, film theory and history teacher, Don Fredrickson. And Don Fredrickson was the sternest professor I had in all the years I was at Cornell in any department. He criticized my writing, he criticized my thinking, but constructively. And I learned how to think better, I learned how to write better, and I learned a heck of a lot about film history and about theory from Don Fredrickson. I'm fundamentally a creative. I've My whole life I've made things with my hands, I've built things, I've conceived things, I've envisioned things. So naturally, I gravitated towards the camera. As well, I came with no money I was putting myself through school so I ended up shooting other people's films because this was these were 16 millimeter mostly reversal films color and they're just I I didn't have any money and I'm in Ithaca New York which is far away from any laboratory Uh, this is quite some time ago this is in the 70s so I'm shooting other people's films I'm getting that kind of experience and I began asking the deeper questions that you ask when you you first learn to shoot film. How does this work? How do I expose for that? Uh, What kind of lens and this, that, and the other? And at Cornell, because there was no film production, nobody had any answers. I remember there was this one guy who was the guru at Cornell in terms of film technology, and he, many years later, became an IA grip in New York. So that 
implies a certain level, but but that's who we had to go to. And, and in fact, things he told me when I was in college turned out not to be true. Not that they were false, but they weren't the whole story and they weren't adequate. I don't do anything halfway, so that set me down a path of trying to embrace as much knowledge as possible about the camera, about film stocks, about optics, lenses, um, about you know the structure of, of storytelling in cinema as I possibly could. At the same time, I was watching about 14 films a week on the big screen because this was before VHS. So I was just in, I was drinking in cinema. Can I ask about cinema. about what year was this? This would have been 1971 through 76. After I graduated and again with a degree degree in psychology and these were heady days in cinema. This was, you know, all the young Turks in Hollywood at that time and the German cinema um, was roaring, new German cinema and uh, Cinema Novo in Brazil and a lot of exciting Latin American filmmaking was going on. And in fact, I helped to run a Latin American film screening series at Cornell in those days. So I was, I had my head full and where else to head to but but New York. In retrospect, I, I realized I could have headed west and gone to Los Angeles. And had I gone to Los Angeles, I'd probably have a very different career. But in those days, I went to New York. And New York was, you, you know, I have a daughter who is um, going to be 20 this year. She's actually um, studying filmmaking at Bard. And she practically grew up in the film forum because, you know, once you have that kind of film going habit, it's a lifelong habit. So I would drag her along. Early on, like most kids her age, she was into Pokemon and and things Japanese. (laughs) And so I thought, well, here's a, a great idea. I'll take her to see Seven Samurai, which she hated because it was too slow. There were subtitles. It's black and white. Where's the color? Well, I, I didn't listen to her. I just kept taking her to these films. And then one day, suddenly, she's seen the latest Michael Haneke film before I have, The White Ribbon. So I go to New York. And, and the reason I'm telling you about my daughter, by the way, before I forget, is because she grew up in a New York where you could just run around as a teenager. And she and all of her friends did, felt perfectly safe. I went to a New York, which was like Midnight Cowboy or Panic in Needle Park or taxi driver and it was skanky and dangerous <laughs> and you 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 heard cracking beneath your the heel of your shoe and it was crack vials or or actually before that it was methadone vials because there were a lot of methadone clinics where i lived and that was fort near union square union square you did not go into but it was exciting the whole city was cinematic experience was vivid Mm-hmm. Everywhere you looked, you just wanted to pick up a camera and grab some friends in the East Village and start making a film. Um, that was exciting. But I was still on this path of learning. I didn't feel I understood the technology. I was looking in the newspaper one day, and I saw an ad in the New York Times, which used to be a cliche, and I got a job. I got a job running an optical printer, an Oxbury optical printer. I had never seen one in my life, but I talked my way into it. They didn't know that. And within a year, I was hired at Duart Film Laboratories to set up and run their optical printing department. Uh, The significance of that is that Duart was a nexus in the independent film world in those days. Uh, Virtually everybody came through Duart. Virtually anyone you can associate with Duart, from, I don't know, Spike Lee to... Uh, Barry Sonnenfeld. Uh, I, I knew them all. When they I remember, were, well, when I went to film school in uh, Florida, we had to get our negatives cut and everything up at Duart or yeah. you know, N&D Film and Video Works, cut my negative and, and had the film printed at Duart. So I was there for um, for seven years, let's say. And I, I when I left, I was the technical director and I was uh, the director of new technology. Mm-hmm. And I was involved in everything from Super 16 blowups. I engineered all of that. And Duart was known for that at the time. Uh, uh, time code on film, synchronizing one-inch Type C machines with ranks and Telltale Cines. Duart was on the cutting edge back in those days. Now those are long gone days. Yeah. But it was an exciting place to be. There came a time when I, you know, had to remember what my initial 
goal had been. And by that time, I, I knew so much about the technical. And in fact, I had even written a brochure for Eastman Kodak on transferring 16 <laughs> millimeter to video. I knew so much about it that that was no longer an issue. I also, in those days, and some people may remember this, I, I set up an, uh, a lens uh, and camera testing facility on a floor in the Duart building, and I had the first lens test projector in New York, if you can believe that, before wow. any of the camera houses did. Really? And what we were doing, we were trying to analyze, because when you shoot Super 16 back in those days and you blow that up to 35, it's putting it under a magnifying glass, and you're magnifying all the errors. So if there are, if the, your lens is, your zoom or whatever is inadequate for any reason, well, it might look okay in 16 and from a 16 answer print, you blow it up to a 35 screen, you see it. So we were trying to analyze which lenses were more appropriate, which were less appropriate. Um, and I learned, I got to know everybody in the optics business. And I got to know, know a lot about lenses through doing that. So basically I got my graduate degree from Duart. <laughs> That's crazy. So you talked your way in, into running an optical printer, which sounds, to me, it sounds like a very complicated thing to do. How do you talk your way into doing something that you don't know how to do that's as complicated as optical printing? You know, I think some people have a talent for appearing to uh, appear knowledgeable. Mm. Um, and I, and I, I may have that gift. But I have to say, I look in the mirror and, I, and I, if I don't know something, I, I admit I don't know it. And I admit it to you or anybody else. However, I don't like... In this industry, and, and this is a phenomenon I think that has snowballed in recent years, there are a lot of self-appointed experts. Mm -hmm. When you're coming up, how do you know who to believe? How do you know who whose advice is, is sage, is good? Yeah. And we all, you know, in time accumulate enough experience and expertise that we, we, we come into our, our own understanding. But I struggled with that for a long time. I did finally reach a point. I think in life, when you try to master something, in time you do. And I did come to a point where I felt I had more than mastered the technical end, and it was time to go back to the artistic and creative side of things. Now, you say that like if you had moved to California instead of New York City, that your trajectory would have been different. Now, I know that it's our stereotype now that that cinema, that that Hollywood cinema in the 1970s was sort of what we think of when we think of independent film. You know, you've got like all these Coppola and De Palma and like and, and people who were doing really unusual and innovative things at the time in Hollywood. What do you think your life would have been like had you moved to Hollywood back then? Well, for one thing, I, I never viewed that as independent filmmaking. It wasn't independent of the industry. Uh, no, no, it was studio backed, but they were taking it was a riskier time. Like, so on, on the East Coast, we were independent. Mm -hmm. I, I knew pretty quickly that New York City was a backwater in terms of film production. <laughs> New York City, however, in those days especially, was the source of all the money. Yeah. So everybody would come crawling in their hands and knees to New York for money. But they would go back to the West Coast and, and make their films. Yeah. In my senior year at Cornell, believe it or not, Warner Brothers used to have a summer student film workshop. And they would invite 12 students, film make, young filmmakers from around the country to participate. I was one of those. Oh, wow. So in the summer of 1976, one, one of the perks of this program, and, and it so happened it was held uh, – at the Cornell campus. These are all uh, wonderfully convenient details. It so happened it was held in Ithaca, New York, which is a lovely place to be in the summer. One of the advantages of being chosen to partic participate in this Warner Brothers summer student film program was that they let each of the 12 of us have our own personal copy of a Warner Brothers film, a film in their catalog for the summer. We had to give it back at the end. I chose Mean Streets. Robert De Niro, Johnny Boy, Mulberry Street. I must have watched that thing 30 times. And it's, you know, it's use of pop music on the soundtrack, which it was known for. And, you know, I didn't know much about Scorsese at that time. I just knew that this film had energy. And I really like the energy in this film. Um, there's a, a, a coda to this story in that many, many, many years ago, I, I've had a number of films at the Berlin Film Festival and, I've, and elsewhere, but I was in Berlin probably in the early 90s, 
and I was either there with a film or or there. I once I got the habit of going. It's my favorite festival, so I've been back many times. But I was in Berlin, and I had some time on my hands, and I went to I don't know a, a theater in I don't know, Charlottenburg or some. I'm not even sure where it was, Kreuzberg. I went there, and because I saw that uh, Mean Streets was playing. And I don't think I had seen Mean Streets in maybe 20 years. It was a, had been a long time. Mean Streets, this, this film that I had loved so much. So I go and I see it and I watch it. And by the way, I always recommend to people that if you haven't seen a film that made an impact on you in a, in a long, long time, make it a point in your life to periodically return to those touchstone films because it's a way to gauge how you've grown, how you've grown more sophisticated or not through mm-hmm. the years. <laughs> so I'm in Berlin and I'm watching Mean Streets and my jaw hits the ground. Now, why does my jaw hit the ground? Because I had moved into a storefront on Mulberry Street and that storefront was the same storefront used as the location for Mean Streets. Um, Harvey Keitel, Robert De Niro, on the fire escape, all, all that took place on my fire escape. Wow. I'm not making this up. I didn't know. It never occurred to me. I never, you know, that was many years ago I'd had that print that I'd watched 30 times that summer. And now all of a sudden I'm in Berlin and I'm looking at where I live used as a location all those many years ago. It's funny how these things connect. Mm-hmm. Life connects. I live in Sherman Oaks. I'm really afraid of where my house was used in a, <laughs> as a location. I always wanted to drop, you know, the cherry bomb in the in the mailbox like Johnny Boy did. I, I've never done that. But I grew up with kids who did do that kind of stuff, yeah. and you know, we were not strangers to explosives. So when I was at Duart, and when I was running the optical printing operation at Duart, I had feelers from ILM. I I could have gone into that direction. ILM existed back then. Yeah, I think so. What year would this be, like mid-70s? No, no, no. This would have been um, 83, 4. Oh, five. okay, yeah. Of course yeah. they would exist. By yeah, they, they already had the droid editing system. Yeah, yeah. Had I gone to Los Angeles and thrown my hat into the ring as a cinematographer, I, I'm pretty sure I, I, I could have had a, a more conventional industry career. Mm-hmm. But I went to New York, and, and I went for uh, two ostensible reasons. One is that, and this is a prejudice, to me, New York was closer to Europe than L.A. was. Hmm. And I expected to find more intellectual stimulation in New York. And the second reason I went to New York was the music scene. I was a jazz head. I'd been a musician. Those were magical years for jazz in New York. Some of my heroes could be, you know, for the price of buying a beer and sitting at a bar, you could watch Ross on Rolling Kirk, you know. It was an amazing time, and I just didn't want, I didn't want to give that up. Mm-hmm. So I stayed in New York. Now, what I gave up was, because it was an industry and perhaps is an industry backwater, it's, it's a different place than Los Angeles. Yes, there were opportunities, but the union situation was more sewn up back in those days. Um, IA 644 was more father-son. Uh, IA 600 didn't exist in that in those days that that was to come later. Um, Nabit 15 was just in its early stages and that was an alternative union for cinematographers that was uh, run by my college buddy Tom Turley. Nabit 15 only became an alternative uh, union, shall we say, for cinematographers because they couldn't get into 644 because it was so buttoned up. What I was exposed to in New York were a lot of scrappy people who were uh, doing whatever it took to make films. And that's true on the West Coast, too, of course. And it was, uh, people would said this was the case, but it proved to be the case. We were really a center for independent film, I mean, truly independent filmmaking, the kind of stuff that would have NEH funding. And we were a center for documentary filmmaking, mm-hmm. truly independent documentary filmmaking. If you are on the scene today and you know about, I don't know, HBO uh, documentary films and all of those divisions of, of uh, cable uh, channels, well, none of that existed back then. People, when you made a documentary, you were out on a limb. You you had financed it yourself. You had put together yeah. all the resources. And you were shooting 16 millimeter. You weren't shooting video. You weren't even shooting beta cam. You were shooting 16 millimeter, which meant that 
you had to buy raw st- stock, you had to, to you know, buy processing. Uh, maybe the lab would print it and let you see what you had, but probably not unless you could pay them up front. And then, of course, you needed to transfer it to video if you expected to edit it on three-quarter inch before you were to do either an online or a film conform or whatever. Yeah. So there was a lot more money up front required before you even went out into the field, whether you were going to South America, which I did multiple times, or to Central and Eastern Europe, which I did multiple times. So it was, you know, we got caught up in those issues. I I was uh, somewhat active in AIVF, the Association of Independent Video and Filmmakers. This was a New York-based organization. The Independent Feature Project for uh, feature filmmakers came along in the early 80s. I was involved with that for years. And we, we created these organizations because we, we really needed support. Uh, we needed some kind of pull um, to draw attention to the work we were doing. So that it was more of an East Coast thing, and that's not to take away from the West Coast. You know, three-quarters of my friends were out here, but it was an East Coast thing, and that's what I got caught up in. No, that's, that's fascinating. And, you know, when you talk about documentaries, too, one of the people who you worked with is, like, I shouldn't say he's one of my favorite documentarians, but the person who made possibly the most impactful documentary I've ever seen, which was uh, Frederick Wiseman with Tinica yeah, yeah. Follies. I've never seen an interview with Frederick Wiseman. Yeah. I don't I don't even know what the guy looks like, but you know, he had an, an enormous impact on me. And I think of him as the ultimate Maverick documentarian who, you know, he has a couple of documentaries that are taught in film school or whatever, but he like turns out a new one every year, doesn't he? He does. Um, I should um, allow asked to Fred is my cousin. Oh. And that that has no bearing. I didn't even know I was related to Fred until I was in my 20s. I ran into him in the hallway at Duart, and he had the same last name my mother did. And I thought, hmm, they're both from Brookline. And I put two and five together, and I figured it out. Yeah. And and Fred, you know, his first reaction was the look on his face was, of course, what do you want from me? <laughs> and But over the years, we got to know each other quite well. I've admired him. I've also become very uh, – I've known – Albert Mazels for many, many oh, wow, years. Yeah. I knew Ricky Leacock. I wouldn't have had these uh, uh, in feature filmmaking, uh, Bob Young, um, and, uh, you know, Victor Nunez, um, uh, a great many other. Well, Nunez is Florida based, isn't he? He is, but always came up to do art to yeah. process his films and blow them up from Super 16 to 35. So I got to know personally um, quite a number of of uh, independent uh, icons, Mm -hmm. if you will. And it just felt like a community, and it felt like a privilege. And that's what I got from sticking around New York. All the kids that came down from the MIT uh, and Harvard, all the kids from NYU and Columbia, you know, it's a little different breed, those that then pursued documentary making. Now, If you'll remember, um, when I first described how I fell in love with film, I never mentioned a single documentary. And that's because I never made the distinction between documentary and and dramatic filmmaking. And to this day, I don't see that distinction. Mm -hmm. I find the the dramatic forms are exactly the same. I find the internal dynamics are exactly the same. Uh, I have shot both. I've had, if you, um, including a three-minute film, I had last year at Sundance, I've had eight films at Sundance as either director or producer or DP. So I, and and it, they're about half and half documentary and drama. Mm-hmm. So I, I continue to uh, have a foot in both camps, but I don't really recognize them as camps. And that influences the way I shoot as well. Eddie Lockman said this to me once, and it sort of stuck with me, that when you're shooting a take on a, on a set, that moment that you're shooting those actors it's a documentary. Oh, yeah. It's how they feel, what's going on in their stomach. Is there, are they focused in their mind? Are they in the right mood? Is, is, the, you know, is there magic in that moment? Or is there tension? Does it suck and they know it? I mean, whatever is going on, the cap, camera is capturing that. Yeah. Eddie, of course, came out of, before he became his, his uh, and he's an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, DP and filmmaker. But when I first met him, he was a documentary cinematographer. And like so many of the other people out of New York were. It was quite a group of people. So if you're saying that you approach cinematography from a documentary, if, if you're doing a documentary or a narrative the same way, I mean, obviously the preparation and the creation, like if you're going to go make a documentary about something, you can't, you have to photograph it while it's more or less happening unless you're doing standard interviews. Walk me through your process uh, and how it differs in how you would prepare to do a documentary. And I think what I'm re- most interested in is, 
how does one inform the other? How, how does shooting yeah. narrative stuff where you have more control in theory, how does that inform documentary and vice versa? The couple of things that always bounce around in my head and I say them to people, Billy Wilder, and I'm not going to paraphrase him accurately, but he basically said in cinema there are no rules. In, mm -hmm. in filmmaking there are no rules. And that's utterly true. So those people that get too dogmatic because I've got a degree from this or that film school, I just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that I'm so uh, underwhelmed by that sort of thing. Look, you live by your wits. If you're in front of or behind the camera, I'm, I'm behind the camera most of the time, you live by your wits. Whether you're shooting drama or documentary, it's very much the same. There are schools of documentary making that hold that you... Uh, I don't know, you, you try to be the fly on the wall. That's what Albert that claims. And that's Frederick or, Wiseman totally. I mean, Frederick no, Wiseman. No, Frederick wouldn't claim that. He, Fred might, he, I'm not, I don't, I don't know if the he words would, in his mouth. But I don't know if he would claim it, but if you watch his, his work, you know, he is possibly, I think, in a sense, one of the bravest documentarians because he doesn't feed you the through line. He doesn't, he, he's just kind of showing up. He's observational. Yeah. And he's patient. And he edits uh, that he edits all of his films, and so he edits that way as well, which means that you have to bring something to the table, in terms of your own insights and your own intelligence and your own patience. When you're shooting for him, no, when you're watching his film. Oh yeah, there's not a different me behind the camera when I'm shooting a documentary, and and a, and a second me behind the camera when I'm shooting a feature. Furthermore, one of the things that happens to you when you shoot documentaries a lot. And this, I think, I can say was especially true in the era before video cameras. In the era before video cameras, you looked through an optical viewfinder, and I was very partial to Aton cameras. I shot my share of it, RESR films, but I was partial to Aton. And you're looking through the viewfinder, and, and, and you know, if you haven't shot, if you're listening to this and you haven't shot with a film camera, but you have used an old-fashioned uh, SLR, with a pentaprism and you look through the lens and you focus the lens on your SLR, you know that when you hit focus, the image is glorious. It's this optical image through the viewfinder. And I used to lose myself into that. I was stunned by what was unfolding in front of me. And, and, and I, I feel the tempo and the rhythm of what's unfolding. I, it's, it's like beats and music. I almost have an extra sense for when someone's going to walk into the frame or someone's coming through the door or someone's about to turn their head. I just sense the those things. And I would lose myself inside the camera as if I were watching the big screen already and somebody else was behind the camera. I used to love that. It was mesmerizing. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen with video cameras. Somehow the video viewfinder gets in the way. All those years we suffered with black and white viewfinders. I thought that was, that was a hideous obstruction. And color viewfinders now, all but the very best, like the latest OLED finders, like Sony has one on the F55. But, but short of that, and, and Red's got a terrific finder, and, and you know the Alexa has a terrific finder. But short of that, the, some of the crummier finders, well, they kind of get in your way. In any case, I don't lose myself in them. So that was, that was an aesthetic connection to the subject matter that was very important to me. I used to love that. When you can feel the subject matter that keenly, it heightens your powers of observation. And you, you notice more. You see more. It's almost like you're high and you hear more, that uh -huh. kind of thing. You see more. Well, remember, you're looking at a viewfinder, and it's framing out all but what's directly in the viewfinder which means your powers of visual concentration are focused on that little rectangle. You learn how to see. You see things very clearly. You learn what real people look like. If you're fully acute, you, you learn what real people sound like. You, you, over time, you really become expert in how they move and how they interact. And this informs all the dramatic work I do. It also informs my eye visually. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I, I've even taught lighting before. I, I used to teach a little the main workshop, and I've taught courses here in, in Cuba and Venezuela and Peru and other places. And w if you take a lighting course from me and you walk into a room, there are no instruments. There are no lighting instruments. Because the first thing you're going to learn to do is to see how to see. Learn how to see light reflected, naturally sourced color, you know, light that's natural picks up color from its surroundings. It throws that color into the shadows, whether, I don't know, it's if you're in the desert, it's an orange look under your chin. I make people learn to see that stuff first. I can light 
expressionistically. I can do, you know, chiaroscuro. I can do um, something John Alton would recognize as, as noir. But I gravitate towards naturalism. Now, it's heightened naturalism because I have lights in there. But if you're looking at it and you're not looking at it very carefully, you're going to think, oh, he didn't light it. Mm-hmm. Yes, he did. But I've studied real images for so long that that's influenced the way I look at them. Now, I, I was over at the Los Angeles County uh, Museum of Art uh, for about almost four hours today looking uh, at the Stanley Kubrick exhibition. Oh, it's amazing. And if you look, uh, of course, Stanley had a brief career as a still photographer, but his entire life he was always a photographer, really. And it's just that he changed his camera from a speed um, graphic or whatever he had to you know, an Airy 2C. All of those images, all the stills, uh, location stills of him behind the camera, of course he's in the UK because back in those days the Union probably wouldn't let the director hold a camera and film here in the States, but all those times he's behind his little Airy 2C and filming, you know, that just, I said, yes, I so recognize that. And he had, I, I think he had the same kind of eye. I think he looked really hard at things. Now, if you look at his films, the style of every film is wildly divergent, but that doesn't mean it's not the same person, and it doesn't mean it's not all based upon observations of reality, photographic observations of reality. Look at the black and white stills he did, the ones that, you know, they they Mm -hmm. reproduced that were in Look magazine, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I do think he's also one of those filmmakers, and there's there's not that many of them where you could look at one frame of any of his films and know you're watching a Stanley Kubrick film. You could show me a frame from Spartacus or a frame from Barry Lyndon, and I could immediately identify, even if I'd never seen that film. Huh. There's like something about the way he shot or something about the way he covered scenes. And it, it's something you don't see as much anymore. I mean, there, I guess there are people like David Lynch or whatever. David Fincher is, is one, I think, too. That's one of the things that makes Kubrick so interesting, in a sense. His stuff elevates to an art form. You know, he's an interesting case also because he, he marinated himself in the ideas that his scripts were formed around. He marinated himself in those ideas for a good while before he shot each of these films. Yeah. So the films embody ideas, and they embody ideas visually, and they embody ideas in the in the script and structure. As you know, because you've seen the exhibit, he used narration a lot mm-hmm. as a framing device, which few people today are, are gutsy enough to do. Everyone th- thinks, well, that's hackneyed, but yeah. actually, it's very hard to do well. And, you know, if you do it well like he did, you get a lot of the exposition out of the way and you can go straight towards what he would often do. Barry Lyndon, and it was pointed out uh, in one of the um, descriptions of the film at the museum, and and the point was well taken, that because the narration had gotten the basic exposition out of the way, that Kubrick could proceed with what were a string of anticlimaxes. Talk about... uh, defying a three-act structure. Barry Lyndon is just a series of anticlimaxes. And the point is not for you to be uh, dramatically carried along what's happening next. You know what's going to happen next. It's a tragedy. But you are able to sit back, distance yourself, and observe. And that is the point. He wants you to look at these people from our perspective several centuries later, how they walked, how they interacted, how they themselves kept a distance from each other. Is the narrator a reliable narrator? Is is Barry Lyndon a liar? Can we trust what he thinks, what he feels? Do we know what he thinks and feels? That's what makes Kubrick profound. I had seen Clockwork Orange, and I hadn't seen Clockwork Orange in many years, and I was dumbfounded. Now, I read the book years ago, and the Anthony Burgess um, experiment in, in creating a, a, a language. I mean, all of that's just brilliant. The book is great. It's one of the few times where I saw the movie, having read the book, and the movie was better. I agree. The movie is the definitive version, not the book. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. I read the version of it where Anthony Burgess includes the 21st chapter that was the original part of that book that basically negates the entire point like it basically if Kubrick had made that last chapter as part of the movie it turns it it nullifies it it just kind of was like yeah forget everything that just happened and it kind of when I finished the book and Anthony Burgess had written an introduction to the version I'd read 
where he sort of said he kind of copped to it, but he's like, but this is the book I wrote. And I was mad that they didn't make that into the movie. It's one of the few movies that I would always cite when people say, well, the movie's never as good as the book. Clockwork Orange is so much better than the book. And the book is great. Now, here's the thing. In the movie, visually, visually, the, the, the author of the book and the author of the, the bones of the story are An, An, Anthony Burgess. But the visual author is Kubrick. Totally. And here's an example. In the milk bar scene, you've got those milk maidens. I don't know quite yeah. how you describe them. The um, lactating mannequins. Exactly. Uh, shackled um, with big you know, balls of, of, of wigged hair. And they, there's a, a white, whitish glow in that milk bar. There's just some weird, everything is white. Well, you can look at the end of 2001 when they're in that white room and everything has an ethereal white glow. If you go to LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, in the next, I don't think, uh, I think it's the exhibit is on is up until next year, maybe next April. It's James Turrell. He works with light. He's an artist of light and space. His insight is that physical structures exist, but without light to perceive those physical structures, you don't perceive that they exist. So therefore, light is elemental uh, and, and primary. And so he experiments with light within structures. So you walk into a room and he'll project a, something that looks like a cube on a far wall, and that cube is made of nothing but light. And you will look at that, and your eyes will turn that cube inside out, and you'll think it's a box facing you or a box facing away from you. James Terrell has done amazing work, and, and I really, to anyone in the visual arts, but especially in cinematography, because we, we try to create impressions written in light. I, I would suggest that any cinematographer try to see James Terrell. But Terrell is very often working with the same kind of white glow that you'll see in the milk bar scene, that you'll see at the end of 2001. That's the kind of visual artist. That's the level that Stanley Kubrick exists on as well. He brought that to his... The, each film has a different design, in effect, mm -hmm. because each film required a different design, and he spent enormous amounts of time thinking about that. And you can see stills at the Kubrick exhibit that show him trying on different types of costumes, hair, uh, production design, uh, types of architecture, interior spaces. It's extraordinary. I didn't know this, and this is uh, not apropos cinematography, but it, there was an entire scene in Dr. Strangelove where that, that huge table that Strangelove and the president and mm -hmm. all the crazy general and all those guys sit around, at the very end of that scene, at the end of the movie, uh, Kubrick had written in a gigantic pie fight. And, I, and, and it's on record, I think, as being the greatest pie fight ever. I think maybe 3,000 pies were tossed. Wow. And the, imagine that whole pristine modernist space with those gigantic screens where they saw the strategic air command uh, jets yeah. you know disappear off the screen it, covered in pie well having shot this huge fracas of a, of a pie fight Kubrick said this doesn't work this isn't right this this kind of makes the whole film trivial and he dropped it after he'd shot the whole thing but they have they have stills there yeah, uh, that's, again, the kind of director. It wasn't the studio saying, cut this out. It wasn't anybody else. It was Kubrick who looks himself in the eye, as it were, and says, you know, I, I went overboard. You look at kind of the obsessive level of detail in 2001 or something like that. Like, I didn't even realize till I was there that all of the Africa stuff at the beginning of 2001 was all front projection. Before I went to the Kubrick exhibit, maybe a month ago, I had seen 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time ever on the big screen at the Cinerama Dome. It's a completely different movie when you see it on the big screen. I've seen it on video my entire life. It feels clinical and boring on video, and when you see it on the big screen, it's like an experience. Cinema, uh, he, he, you know, all hail Scotchlight with the little beaded, glass beaded screens. We, yeah. I used to love that too. You're right about that, and that brings up another point. One of the things that differentiates cinema from watching something on your iPad, let's say, is scale. Cinema requires scale. Now, can a film be cinematic that you're watching on a very small screen? I, I suppose it can, and many are. But for a cinematic experience, 
or an experience of cinema, you need scale. It needs to be really large. And 2001, I saw it played probably 10 years ago in Berlin during the Berlin Film Festival. They had just restored it on this enormous screen, the main festival screen in at the Berlinale. It's as big as any screen I know of in the States. And, of course, the Germans are uh, fanatic about precision projection. It was stunning, just stunning. And to where I don't think I could look at that on a small screen. I mean, it would be a facsimile, but it wouldn't be 2001. Yeah. It's like the perfect example of a movie that, that uses the full screen. So let's loop back around. Okay. I kind of want to get you from you know, working at Art to you picking up a camera and starting to shoot. Right. And I want to focus as much as possible on creative impulse and the, and the creative processes that you were going through um, right. when you did that. When um, I, I mentioned that when I was at Cornell and became almost by gravitational pull uh, a filmmaker there, I didn't have money, much money to make films. I, I did a little here and there, made a little short films, but I, I was shooting for other people. And it was a way to get my hands on the camera, and it was a way to gain experience. When I got to New York, I wasn't in New York very long before I found this job. Uh, I talked my way into operating an optical printer. And I always consider that a bit of a diversion, because for the next seven years, I didn't shoot terribly much. I shot here and there. I, I, I went to Chile and shot a documentary. I went to Monaco and filmed the Grand Prix uh, with um, Barry Brown, who's a... Um, a, film, a very good filmmaker in his own right. But I wasn't shooting constantly. What I was doing, though, because I had built this facility to analyze cameras and lenses in terms of their um, sharpness of image and, and, and so forth, is I was getting to know every camera in the universe because people would bring in their, their cameras, 35 and 16. I got to know virtually every lens that was extant at that time. I put them up on the lens test projector. I examined them for hours. I pulled them apart. When I did leave Duart, it left an impression. It stamped me in this way. To this day, I, I'm not a partisan of any particular camera. I'll use whatever camera I think is interesting for a particular project, and the same with lenses. And that has its pluses and minuses. You use a camera a lot, you get to know it really well, like the back of your hand. You use a lot of different cameras, and you get to know something else, which is a lot about a lot of different cameras, and that's got its own value as well. So I, as a result, I've shot, and I don't think I ever shot 65, but I've shot everything else. I've shot with virtually every film camera. I've shot with most of the major video cam, I mean, everything from high 8 up to, you know, HD cam, and I've shot with, um, I've been doing a lot of shooting lately with F, an F55, a C500, you know, to a codex recorder. I did a four, some 4K shooting about a week ago. So I've shot with a lot of different things. And to me, it's all, it's the same, I have the same drive no matter what I'm shooting with, and that's to try to do something creative with, with the image that I'm making. Mm -hmm. That's to try to take whatever the tool I have is and try to suss out its properties and then try to use those properties to, to achieve something that I feel interested in myself. Again, I don't want to get too mired down in the tech, but can you give me some examples of the kind of creative work that you're going to do when you pick up a, a new camera or when you're picking something up and evaluating it. What is the creative process by which you work? And that maybe doesn't even have to be specifically. About the Let camera. me answer that a different way. You, you know, we're in, an, in historic times right now, meaning that we're shifting from a photochemical fundamental to digital, electronic. And this has been going on for a couple of decades, but as you know, film laboratories are going out of business almost, it seems like, by the month. We're really in uh, at the cusp of uh, an all-digital di era right now. And we've seen any number of, of, of types of camera designs. Uh, you know, if you've used the F3, you know, from Sony, you know that was kind of like a, like a blown-up handy cam, that, and that was a mistake. Camera companies have been learning um, the most recent crop uh, from Sony, the F5 and the F55, I call it, they're, they're like little, little uh, smaller versions of the Alexa. They're kind of longish and they fit on your shoulder. Well, that was, that's due to a learning curve. Sony is slowly beginning to understand what it takes to build a camera that can be used as a cinema camera. They have PL mounts. What I do these days, all of the 
major cameras, whether it's Red Epic or, or Alexa or um, an F55 or a Canon C500, any of these cameras, they're all first rate. They all can shoot remarkable images. I'm primarily first interested in the lens because the camera, if the, the more perfect, now this term perfect is tricky. It's full of you know minefields and, and I shouldn't use it, but let's say the better the camera is, the more faithfully it reproduces the image that the lens creates in the first place. Mm -hmm. In other words, the better the camera is, the more it just gets out of the way. My number one concern when using a new camera are what lenses am I going to be using? And, and I mean that uh, and, and, and highlighted in yellow. Second, and this may surprise you, ergonomics. Now, any camera can be bolted to a tripod, but not any camera can comfortably sit on your shoulder. And I'm not a fan of building cages and contraptions and hanging gizmos off of my camera. I'm, an, I'm a minimalist. I want to rip all that stuff off my camera. I'll even take the map box off if I don't need it. I don't want extra crap on my camera. I want it minimal. Mm -hmm. And that may derive from my documentary background. Regardless, light and ergonomic. I'm in Los Angeles because I just gave a talk at Paramount during Cinegear Expo, and my talk was sponsored by Sony, but the talk wasn't really about Sony per se. It was about the general talk topic of ergonomics. And I talked about what a hand grip needs to be, where controls need to be, how the camera needs to balance. And this is of critical concern in a time of large sensor cameras for two reasons. One is that the large sensor means that the lenses are going to tend to be larger than they were in the days of a two-thirds inch or one-third inch sensor. They just are. And two, there's going to be less depth of field. And a lot of kids especially go, wow, 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 that's great, cinematic. I don't think that's true. And I always cite the example of Citizen Kane to kind of undercut that. But nonetheless, people like that look. And it does come in handy in, in doing uh, documentary interviews when your background's kind of not very attractive. It's fun to throw the background out of focus. I acknowledge that one. But when you're hand-holding a camera, and remember, I can put a camera on any dolly or any tripod. That's not a problem. But putting it on my shoulder is something else. So if a camera is good that way, if it's comfortable on my shoulder and it has a viewfinder that I, I like, and I mentioned a number that I think are pretty good, well, the next question is, how do I check the focus? Because remember, I, I no longer have an optical viewfinder. Most of these cameras have a magnification function, and you're looking through the viewfinder, and you can magnify two times, and sometimes even four or eight times in, in one case. All right, where's that control? And here's an example of poor ergonomic design. Most of the hand grips on most of these cameras are basically something like you might find at the end of a bicycle handlebar. And I, I find that completely useless. I don't want to be steering a bus with two hands when I'm hand-holding a camera. A camera, when it's properly balanced on your shoulder, should, should be balanced and held by one hand only, your right hand. The left hand should be able to be completely free. If you want to focus the lens with it, you can, or turn a, a lens knob, you can. But your left hand should be able to be completely free. That grip should fit your hand almost as if you took a ball of clay and squeezed it. And if you take a ball of clay and squeeze it, you'll see that, that clay will come out from the top and, and kind of fall over your thumb. That's how the Aton walnut hand, hand grip came about, which was designed in the early 70s. It has a hook over your thumb. Why do you want that? Because sometimes the weight of the camera comes down on that. Sometimes you're tilting down, sometimes you're tilting up, sometimes some idiot in the crowd knocks into you and almost knocks the camera out of your hand. If you've got that hook around your thumb and you're, you're holding onto that single grip, you won't drop that camera. Now, it's become a fad in the past year to create all these wooden hand grips, and there are, I don't know, four or five or six in the offing. Some of them are truer to the principle I just described, and some don't get it at all. A wooden hand grip isn't enough. It needs to have a button, maybe even several buttons. But what the camera manufacturers think to put on all a hand grip that has a button is an on-off button. Why do we want an on-off button on our hand grip? Well, 
maybe to start and stop the camera, but if you think in terms of ergonomics, what do we do the most while we're shooting, while we're, we've got the camera on our shoulder and we're following someone around or we're doing a take, and it can be dramatic or documentary, we're checking focus. How are we checking focus? Well, maybe we have a focus assistant and maybe we have a wireless focus control and all of that, but if you're doing it yourself, what are you doing? Well, you're not, because the buttons that uh, create the magnification to check focus are on the damn side of the camera. So what, I'm really going to stop the shot and take the camera off my shoulder and, and look for that button and press it? That's ridiculous. So in the front of the wooden hand grip should be a button under your index finger because you're going to check focus 10 times during that shot, I guarantee it, because someone's going to lean back three inches and you're going to go, yikes, I'm wide open, I better ch touch up that focus. You know, the focus was on his eyes, but now it's on the tip of his nose, I better touch it up. Well, no one's figured that out yet. I, I'm astonished by this. And the start-stop button, if you even put it on the hand grip, put it in the back where the thumb is. You only hit it once at the beginning of a shot and once at the end, that's all. What else do you check during a shot? Well, maybe the, the little dial wheel like, like Canon has on their hand grip for the C5, uh, C300 and C100. That's not a bad idea. It operates a uh, Canon EF lens. and. That, that's very useful. The only problem with the Canon hand grip is if you hold that thing in your hand, your index finger can't get up on top adequately. It's really hard to reach that little wheel. And that's because Canon hasn't adequately figured out those ergonomics. Why is the wheel on top? Why isn't it facing forward? Lots of things like that. And the stuff I'm describing is so basic and so simple, but I can only conclude that people that design the cameras that we're using now, and I'm speaking specifically of digital cameras, digital cinema cameras, people that design them don't use them. There's an exception, which would be the Alexa. Well, yeah, and I think that that's why a lot of the professionals gravitate towards Airy, because those guys know how to make cameras for an operator. I've always thought of, of it as like film cameras were often built sort of with the operator forward, like it starts at the operator and the engineering goes from there. And I've often felt that with the digital cameras, especially when they were more like camcorders, it starts from the engineering and goes backwards. And the last thing they consider is how some poor schmo going to haul this thing around all day long. Ari's been in the business uh, since the 20s of making film equipment and film cameras. Their roots are in that soil, but none of the Japanese companies have roots in that soil. None of them made cinema cameras before. They yeah. may, may have made beta cams or they may have made DSLRs. So to them, this is all new. Now, in time, this will probably be sorted out. But what if I have a shoot tomorrow morning? That's not in time for me. You asked, you know, what goes into my choices of gear and how do I evaluate a new camera? These are, this is what goes through my mind. What lenses will I have to work with? And is it ergonomic? And you can say to me, well, you're not shooting a documentary. This is a dramatic scene today, or this is a, I don't know, I don't shoot commercials, but this might be a, that kind of a shoot. And it's all lit, and you're on a dolly, and you don't, I guarantee you at some point the camera is going to pop off of that head, or I'm going to want to pop it off. If you'll notice in all the stills of Stanley Kubrick shooting with that Airy 2C, He's holding that in his hands all the time. There are shots you can get and there are moments you can capture, regardless of the type of shooting you're doing, that can only be grabbed if you have an eye for it, you see it happening, you are able to shoot almost immediately. You don't have to use that shot, but if you have it, you know, an editor more times than not will go, hey, that's cool, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> so, and, and, I, and that's from experience. So those are the things I look for. And it's still a struggle and we're still in this historic period where these cameras were evolving so fast, like every year and a half or so, if you attend NAB every year, you know that, you know, every year there's something new and you're going, wow, there's a black magic design camera. Wow, that didn't exist a year ago. And look at the price point. And, you know, I ask people who get excited about those things to not overlook the ergonomics. Now, people who are buying into those types of cameras, of course, are looking at cage designs. They're shoulder mounts and batteries stuck to the back and some kind of big LCD display out front. Well, I think it's the bargain that we make. I mean, I moved from a camcorder kind of a world, you know, with, like I had an HVX200 and a Canon XL2 and like all these different cameras to a Canon 5D Mark II about three years ago. And I love the images you get out of the 5D, but you obviously have to put up with a lot of bullshit just to get those images. 
And I think it's kind of the bargain that we've struck. For me, someone who started in film, the idea of being able to create images like that in the first place is sort of science fiction and fantasy all combined. So I'm willing to put up with all kinds of stuff. That being said, everything I've seen from the Black Magic camera looks really good, but the ergonomics are a nightmare on that camera. If you're gonna if you're gonna be using that camera, it's because you're willing to put up with that. Right. And your point's well taken. I always say to people, when you look at something that's particularly well shot, in the old days, with golden eyes, because I <laughs> remember I worked in a lab, so I looked at people's dailies. I looked at Woody Allen's dailies, you name it, lots of stuff. And I could tell the difference between 35 and 16 in a heartbeat. I could tell usually the difference between, I don't know, a 100 EI stock and a 500 EI stock. Or, you know, you could tell those things pretty quick. You can't anymore. It's very confusing. So when people are looking at a film they really admire and they can't tell what it was shot on, I always say, well, if you can't tell, what difference did it make? Exactly. And that's what's great about it is that if I was to show a feature film to somebody who was a civilian who wasn't into filmmaking that was shot on the DVX 100 on on a, on the big screen where I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, they might not be, have the vocabulary to articulate why it didn't look right, but something about it looks wrong. And today, Francis Ha comes out and it was shot on the 5D Mark II and you hear critics raving about the beautiful cinematography done on a $2,000 camera. Nobody bats an eye. I think that's a giant win for us because we can choose the tool that works best for the job and it's not going to be a giant budget thing. Although still, if you wanted to shoot Alexa, I mean, the Alexa is comparatively way cheaper than say an Airy 435 or something like that. It's impossible. I wouldn't say impossible. It's next to impossible to tell the difference. I can't tell the difference anymore. And I used to be a projectionist and I look at all this stuff constantly. I used to pride myself in being able to pick out Kodak from Fuji stock. So. Exactly. And Agfa before that. Yeah. You know, if you saw uh, Lena Dunham's uh, Tiny Furniture, her DP was quoted um, in several interviews as basically saying he'd never shoot with a Canon 7D again. But look at what that film achieved. It, it launched her career. Sure. It's a wonderful independent film, almost in the in, in an old school kind of way, especially when you're starting out. It's by it's like Malcolm X said, by whatever means necessary, whatever can get you to that finish line is legitimate. Years ago, every time Kodak came out with a new film stock, they'd always say it's sharper and more colorful than the stock that came before. And I know because I used to do a lot of sp- split screen tests that that we would put on as public demonstrations at Duart. And then I started thinking at one point, I said, well, wait a minute, wasn't the last one more colorful and sharper? And then I began thinking even further, and I I realized, who said that sharper and more colorful was necessarily a desirable goal? Because compare cinematography to the other graphic arts, where texture is a choice, color, you, you know, weight of materials. In cinematography, if, if you're a tech head, especially, or in digital cinematography, you think, I want less noise, a lower noise floor, and I want uh, a wider color gamut, and I want a lens that's sharper than four, even 4K is. And you start pushing these, you know, I want to... 60 frames a second, 48, then 60, then 120 frames a second, which, by the way, is now a standard. And and, and you you just want to keep pushing that bar higher. Well, as an artist, I recoil at some point, and I go, you know, there have been wonderful films shot in Super 8 that would not have been any better. In fact, that was part of their character. You know, there have been films shot in Pixel Vision, and that was part of their character. So... What I see is the palette expanding. If you want to shoot on a high-end digital camera and and produce like a digital version of Barry Lyndon, which is increasingly possible, that's one thing. But if you want to shoot the same thing on a coarser camera that perhaps has a different kind of character, but it is character, visual character, that's more than legitimate. People are, as you know, now shooting on uncoated lenses. And that's kind of what they're seeking, is they're seeking something that's less than perfect. All the all this old cooked glass that has yeah. is, is been, you know, soaked up because everybody likes the look of these of imperfection. Have you seen a uh, dog shit optics? S C H I D T <laughs> look them up it's these guys that bought these old russian lenses uh-huh. and they're taking all the coatings off of them and they're creating things that like one of their lenses is called flare factory uh, 58 i think and it's a 58 millimeter lens and it's like there's just no coatings and they they have like uh they remove all the coatings so that you get like 
the least contrast humanly possible. If you look it up, I, I found them a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, and I'm I'm trying to order one, but they don't even have like a real store. They're based out of England, and uh, you ha- they have an Etsy shop online, so it's sort of like an artisanal, like weird lens thing, and they they leave cleaning marks on the lenses and stuff like that, so you can get these weird optical artifacts. Yeah, I mean, I've been a fan also of like Lens Baby from the beginning because right, Lens right. Baby added like a weird analogness to the digital photography and then ultimately to once I was able to put it on my 5d to cinematography and it was like wow cool like something that doesn't feel like dialed in by a robot one of, one of the changes recently that's uh, of significance Sony in particular with what they call their FZ mount and that's a large uh, uh, clamping type of mount positive lock type of mount that uh, fits on their f55 f5 and f3 and it allows the easy addition of adapters for virtually everything from pl to nikon to canon to you name it you can put anything on these cameras and micro four thirds cameras have the same advantage too because they've got that very shallow flange focal distance so this is something new now with some of these cameras you, you you can say, all right, I'll shoot, I don't know, I'll shoot with an F5, and I'm going to select like an EF lens, a Canon EF lens, and it's a piece of cake. That was, ne- you, tilt-shift lenses used to, you know, used to have to go to Auto Nemitz or something to get a modified tilt-shift lens. Not anymore, or Denny Clair- Claremont, not anymore. Um, you know, you, you just have to find a way to get an EF adapter for your camera, whatever your camera is, and then you've got a tilt-shift lens from Canon. That's fabulous. You know, the macro lenses that they make, incredible. So we're living in a world now where a whole explosion of lenses are available. And what does that bring us back to? It brings us back to cinematography. It brings us back to thinking in terms of lenses as opposed to, like, pushing a rocker zoom on on a little camcorder. When you start thinking in terms of lenses, now that's cinematography. Uh, Oh, I should say lenses on a motion picture camera. So um, one question I've, I've been asking everybody, and I kind of have a pet theory about this, but I want to hear your uh, your sense of it, is that I feel like DPs, as a general rule, approach an image or a scene either from composition first or from lighting first. Some guys love lighting, and the composition serves the lighting, and obviously some guys, it's all about the composition and just making whatever lighting has to happen for the composition. Do you fall in either particular camp? Is there a specific I'm way? I'm not even know? sure what you're... If- what you're saying is particularly true and I'll tell you why because you know it's not clear to me that motion pictures or commercials in particular are DP's medium commercials are a producers medium I mean that's why producers uh, when they understand the advantages of 4k are all for it because after the shoots over and they pay the DP and he goes wandering off producer can go into post and reposition and reframe that's you know who what producer producing commercials doesn't want total control so so that's not a a dp's medium in feature filmmaking you know in theory it's the director whose whose medium it is it's not always true either Uh, there are many 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 young directors working with many 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 really seasoned dps which is a smart combination in which case the director may or may not feel very strongly but usually they do about the composition so who's deciding the composition it's not the dp if it's a visual director, they're probably deciding the, comp- the composition. And so the DP, who on a feature set is really the head of a department and is conferring with the gaffer and everybody else and a little army of people are lighting the set. Well, you see what I'm saying? It's almost as if, okay, I'm the director and this is the scene I want. And you maybe you and the DP have spent weeks tearing photographs out of magazines and coming up with a look. And it's up to the DP then through lighting to achieve that look. But how much authorship does the DP have in that situation? And that's an open question. I think and, it depends from, from DP to DP, some DPs. I think it depends on the project. It, it obviously depends on the project, but I do think that there are certain DPs who you hire because they get a specific look or there's a specific thing they do. Yeah. I mean, you think about like Robert Richardson. You know, Robert Richardson had, always comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's like one of, one of the most, you know, like you can spot him a mile away. And yeah, when he works for Quentin Tarantino, his stuff looks different than when he's working for Oliver Stone. Or Errol Morris, you know. Oh, God, yeah. But... 
like I was watching Fast, Cheap and Out of Control by Errol Morris. And I'm like, something about this guy's work looks really, really familiar. And of right. course it was him, you know. Right. And Errol Morris, that's the only movie that he ever shot all of for Errol Morris. He shot, I think, some of Mr. Death. Also, like Errol Morris is a true auteur and his films have a specific look. Would you look at any of those shots of the gardener of David Mendoza out there uh, trimming the trees in, in Fast, Cheap and Out of Control and not say that's a Robert Richardson shot? And to me, I've never interviewed Robert Richardson, but I imagine lighting is something that's, that's the most important thing to him. Errol is not um, a visual stylist, even though his films are visually styled. Mm -hmm. And so he's worked always with strong, I mean, to Errol's credit, he's worked with strong DPs. He has visual ideas, don't get me wrong. But those have been very successful collaborations. Well, the Interotron is possibly one of the strongest documentary visual ideas I've ever seen. I just think when you're outside the, the, the realm of being a DP, you, you know, you tend to romanticize a bit, and especially in this time of, of shifting um, responsibilities, and in this time where you you know, it, it, when I started out, there weren't even video assists. So if I were standing behind the camera and w waving my light meter around and performing magic, and then maybe a day later, we're all in a screening room and we're looking at this glorious surprise on the screen. Even I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, even though I have an idea. And everyone looks to me as the, 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 the wizard, you know, the person who makes this magic happen. And how they do it, we don't know. Well, fast forward to today, where anybody can with a credit card, go to B&H, buy a digital camcorder, hook up a fairly inexpensive small monitor. They can even go into the menu of the camcorder and dial up different gammas if they wish, if they understand that sort of thing, and change the look, and voila, they've done it. You're on a set today, and of course there's a video village, if not several, and everybody is both scrutinizing your work and probably, you know, secretly critiquing it. Who knows? That was never true in the past. And so in these latter days, I think the traditional DP has less power artistically than ever, mm -hmm. is less central in some respects to the final product than ever. And I'm not saying this ruefully, because, you know, I've, it, it's been a slow evolution, and we've all lived through it. But it is different now. It is different now. There are people like Yuri Naiman who's even suggesting that we change the title of DP to Director of Imaging. He's trying to acknowledge the fact that virtually every shot in a feature has some kind of uh, co something composed into it. You know, it's been digitally composed, or, or um, what am I trying to say? An effect has been added it's in. It's been graded after the fact. Not graded so much, but but actually things have been composited into it. Oh, yeah, well, that happens. It yeah. happens sometimes in every shot. And, you know, when we're living in a time in which you can reframe and you can stabilize and you can take out some object like wires that aren't supposed to be there and you can add in things that weren't there in the first place in fact you can shoot entire films where people are like interacting with things that weren't there on the set what is a dp and and this came um to the fore recently with the life of pi and it became quite controversial in certain circles the uh, oscar for best cinematography in that context well it wasn't the cinematographer but it was uh, Ang Lee when he accepted for best director didn't even thank the visual effects department and that movie is practically a cartoon well but that movie got the Oscar for best cinematography yeah it got both with the with with virtually every shot in that movie uh, being a composited shot so that 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 raised the ire of, of a great many more traditional cinematographers some of whom defended and some of whom criticized and said, how, how, how is that fair? Because, of course, once you get into the digital realm, you can't quite change lighting, but you virtually can. You can, you can modify so many uh, vectors of an image that, you know, where does that leave the traditional DP? I wonder, and maybe you can speak to this, why don't more DPs learn how to, learn how to grade their own material? Well, that's a great question, except for in the old days, quote unquote, you know, that's not what a DP did. A DP was the director of photography. A DP ran the, that department and supervised that 
those people, all the assistant camera people, you know, was responsible for the lighting in the end. And, and you know, if there was a signature look, it was responsible for that. Um, why should that craftsperson be expected to assume the job of another craftsperson, which used to be known as the timer or color timer or grader? Yeah, I mean, I think it's unfortunate, but at the same time, I know editors who come from the time where all you did was cut picture, maybe add a fader or a dissolve, even in the Avid, you know, even after we got out of film and you're cutting in the Avid. And a lot of those guys are like keyframing. That's the visual effects guy titles. That's the graphic right. department. The reality of it is if you're a picture editor now, you're expected to do a lot of that stuff. You're maybe not expected to do full visual effects, but you'll have to do kind of some slap comps and you'll definitely, definitely have to do some sound design and some audio mixing and it might all get replaced later. But as an editor, you're throwing in sound effects and all that stuff. And I do think like, uh, for instance, there's a DP I know named George Foyt who he learned how to grade and when you work with him you know he loves to do narrative stuff and he loves to get it in his deal that he's going to end up grading the the end material and i don't have a problem with that i think it's awesome that somebody else some that the guy who is the author of the image is seeing it through at the very end that isn't to say that he's going to do the opposite of what the director wants but i also know i and they will remain nameless i know uh, a dp who had somebody come in after they'd shot the film, they shot the full film, the grade went completely against what they had shot. Uh, and when they saw the final thing, it's like, this isn't my work. Well, of course, that brings up the whole subject of shooting raw. Shooting raw and not having a baked in look. When you shoot raw, of course, it leaves the door wide open to changing the look of the image later after it's demosaicked mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's processed. And that brings up the even deeper question, who owns the image in the end? The director? Who has artistic, who, sh who should own the image? And that's profound, and there's no real way to answer that. The producer who pays for it, does he own it? Who owns the image? Well, does the DP own the image? Who, I mean, ownership, and the, and, ownership is kind of a, is an interesting thing to talk about, but who's being given credit for the image? So if a director has a film taken away from them and recut and it's, they've changed the meaning of it within the DGA, you can have your name taken off the film. I don't know that DPs have that option, even if they wanted to. But if you hire Roger Deakins to shoot your film and then, you know, and he goes for a really saturated, bloomy look and then you go into Resolve or whatever, Scratch or whatever you're doing everything in and you suck his look out and turn it into a black and white thing and you've changed what he brought to it, except for the contrast levels of, you know, the light to the dark thing and maybe even that to a degree. So have you have you taken his authorship off of it? I mean, I, the great DPs are people, you know, who 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 have a look. What Gordon Willis used to do, and one reason that he was tagged the Prince of Darkness, is that when he was doing dark cinematography, creating images with a lot of darkness, he would expose those images so low on the tonal scale that they couldn't be printed up. If they were printed up, they would go milky. So he tied the hands of the film timer, in effect. Mm -hmm more power to him in those days the godfather is a very good a very famous example of that that's not possible today when you shoot raw the whole point of raw is that you have maximum flexibility in post to move around the look of that image now in traditional filmmaking after production wraps the dp goes off so now we're in a, in a time where the dp if the dp wants to have a say the dp I mean, the DP, of course, can create lookup tables, and those can be agreed upon, but unless it's contractual, and who's going to give up that kind of power, because power doesn't give itself up, the producer is never going to agree to let the DP have final say, maybe in the case of Roger, but with a great many other people, no, nor will the director, but on some handshake basis, they'll say, yes, if you want to be there when we do color correction, you, Mr. DP, feel free to come and do that. In other words, they're expecting us to show up in a DI suite for color correction or color grading without pay for a couple of weeks. And many DPs do that because they're protective of their children. Yeah. They labored hard and they're more deeply invested in the look. They're more knowledgeable about what into what went into it and what it can be than the director 
who it wasn't the director's primary role to visualize to the degree the DP's role was. The producer, of course, is usually out sitting over there out to sea, worried about other issues, financial and so forth. It's not practical. If the DP is a busy DP, they're off on another shoot when that happens. That, depending upon the post-production schedule, that DI color correction session may get slid back a week or slid forward a week and the DP's probably not available. If it happens on the other coast, who's going to pay for that flight? Who's going to pay to put up the DP? It just goes on and on and on. I worked mostly in indie films. I was, for uh, a nanosecond, I was an IA644 DP on the East Coast. This was before 600. The reason I didn't work out, and I, I'm a fan of the union. I'm not, I'm not, this is not meant as a criticism, but I like to put my hands on things. I put my hands on the camera. I, if I want to pick up a light and move it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to experiment with that. I'm going to use big lights or small lights, a big camera or a small camera. I'm going to do different things, and I'm, I don't want someone telling me what I can and can't do because of a bunch of rules. So I'm not really perfectly cut out for that situation. This is an important point. Because I'm not working in in industrial filmmaking, and I don't mean making industrials, I mean that commercial filmmaking on a set with a union crew is an industrial environment. When I shoot features, and I've directed a feature, and I've produced at least three features, if not four, um, dramatic features, when I'm shooting a feature film, I work on a basis of trust with the director and the producer and because we're we know we're working with not a lot of money try to form a bond based on the the, the collegiality of of all trying to pull like a team of horses in the same direction now what i just said rarely happens that way because in fact anyone that's worked on a film set for any length of time knows that uh the biggest problem working on any film set, but particularly one that's pressured by money, is factions evolve. Um, and people, uh, for various reasons, uh, don't get along. But that's my MO. I always try to bring everybody together. I, I once uh, I directed a feature. It was uh, Patrick Wilson, the actor's first feature. And what I did is that we, re- we did a script reading, and I had the entire crew involved in the script reading down to the grips. We all read the script together. And that allowed for everyone to contribute what they thought might be an issue for certain scenes. How many people was that total, do you think? Oh, gosh. Uh, it might have, I'm trying to re- do this from memory, but there might have been, I don't know, 30 or 40 people there. Um, you know, smallish crew, independently produced film. Getting to your point about why don't DPs grade their own films, the very notion, the very idea, traditional idea of a DP is is under attack just by these changing times. I don't know if it's going to survive. I have a copy of Resolve. I have a copy of Premiere Pro. I have uh, <laughs> Final Cut 10. I have uh, After Effects. I have a copy of Smoke. I am fairly proficient on a lot of these programs. Um, I have been editing, I've been timing uh, since the days of color reversal, including using Hazeltine, so I know something about color timing. I, I know quite a bit about color correcting video, a la Da Vinci. So I've always had my hands in it, and I recommend that DPs understand their medium, much in the same way that traditional painters might go so far as to mix their mediums. What I mean by that is like a you might take a, some oil and pigment and make your own oils, or you might take egg tempera, you know, and and throw you know egg whites and throw some pigment into that. You might take your brush and 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 cut the tip in a certain way, or use a something that's not traditionally a brush to dab paint on. By doing that, you get to know your materials particularly well. I got to know film very well working in a laboratory. I have always valued knowing not just the camera and not just the lens, but knowing under the hood how those images were processed, whether it was photochemically or in the case of analog video, you know, into video components and then recorded magnetically by a spinning head onto a, 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 a ribbon of tape 
or these days captured as compressed files or even uncompressed files. And I'm very interested in gamuts. I'm very interested in uh, color subsampling. I'm very interested in how wavelet compression works versus uh, discrete cosine type of compression. The, the, the point is, this isn't for everybody, but I think your point is well taken, that you should learn as much about color science as possible, A, and B, learn to color correct. And a shortcut to that, if you don't have a program, if you're not using, I don't know, Apple Color or, you know, there's several out there, Resolve, Resolve is free, you can download yeah. it for free. No excuse if to not, not use If you're not doing that, use Photoshop. Now, the terminology is different in Photoshop. You can take your still images, but by playing around with the, with the various image parameters in Photoshop, you're teaching yourself fundamentally the ways in which images can be manipulated, be it still or digital motion. Don't forget, is you know Jim Gennard might point out that that digital cinema is just a still frame 24 times a second. So anything you can do in Photoshop, you can do that to a digital cinema image. The terminology might be a little bit different, but it's the same game. I've even heard of people using uh, Lightroom. Uh, I think Stu Meshwitz was writing about using Lightroom to grade stuff off of the Black Magic camera because if you shoot raw, you're basically shooting an image sequence. So you can bring it in and grade it totally in Lightroom. Right. But we are in that era, and we're not in the past era anymore. That's gone. I loved it. I can load any magazine in the dark. I was, uh, <laughs> just interestingly, uh, as a side note, I was just at the Tribeca Film Festival, and there was a screening of a documentary about Clint Eastwood. And at the end of the document that, that uh, Schickel did, um, Peter Schickel. I haven't seen it. The, the critic. It is Peter Schickel, right? I hope so. And at, at the end of the screening of the documentary at the Tribeca Film Festival, there was a uh, an on-stage discussion between um, Clint Eastwood and Darren Aronofsky. And Aronofsky asked Eastwood, have you shot digital yet? And Eastwood said, no, no, actually I haven't. I'm probably going to have to soon, but I haven't. He said, how about you? Have you shot digital. Aronofsky said, well, actually, I, I haven't either. He said, you know, but I may have to soon because we're, we're getting a film together in New York, and you know, we, we can't find a second assistant camera. And what he meant by that is someone to load magazines. Hmm. But what that meant was that there probably are a handful of people in New York, but they're all busy because the industry has contracted so much. And what I mean by that is the, the people who have the craft skills necessary to be good at that are, are, are diminishing in number. So, we don't live in the former golden era of photochemical film anymore. We all loved it. I loved it so much, I devoted my life to it. We're now in this era, the digital era. And when you can use any number of nonlinear editing systems that give you color correction, and you know you can demosaic on a laptop, and you can you can do any kind of processing on a laptop. There's really no excuse not to know these things, even if you're the DP. I feel like uh, our our time is running short, but I, I would be so remiss to not talk about uh, your uh, your history with uh, film festivals and even founding some film festivals or running some film festivals. Correct? Yes, that's right. I'd like to hear your understanding from the other side. I know it doesn't directly pertain to cinematography, but I think it, it pertains to filmmaking and obviously celebrating cinematography and celebrating cinema. I, I co-founded a documentary, uh, International Documentary Festival in New York that ran in the late 90s at the DGA in New York. And um, it was it's, it's well missed by any, anyone who was there. Every film in this festival got a 40-minute discussion on stage Serious discussion. I was I, I ran most of those discussions, and every film got an eleven hundred word essay, and I wrote most of those essays. Nonetheless, and each film was screened once, so we we always filled the auditorium. They were always really in, interesting, intense encounters with the filmmakers. Fred Wiseman was one of them. I had a great conversation with Fred because Fred doesn't like stupid questions. And, what would a uh, stupid question be to Frederick Wiseman? Well, most most Q and A's at most festivals are just pablum. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in fact, one of the reasons I got involved with starting this festival was I, I so disliked that. I love this field so much that I want it to be treated with respect, and I don't want people getting up during film festivals and asking fluff. I want incisive questions about the art and the craft of filmmaking. And I thought, well, if I if I can't find this anywhere, I'll do it myself. And I did. 
So when you got up on stage with me, you were getting up on stage with someone who had made films too. And I wasn't interested in you, you know, your, your vanity uh, answers. I was interested in getting to the nitty gritty. And so Fred and I had a great back and forth. I loved the field so much that to this day, I, I see as many films as I can. I think cinema is, and I, cinema includes digital, is a living medium. And to, to be part of it, you can't just make your own films and then go off to the side and cook up your next one and then make it and go. You have to, you have to experience what everyone's doing. And when you do that, what you realize is that cinema's never been more vital than it is now. I'm at Sundance every year, whether I have a film there or not. I'm, I'm usually at Berlin, whether I have a film there or not. And I'm just amazed at the creativity today. And the digital era has just raised the bar on this stuff. It's very fashionable to say that, oh, you know, there's nothing good in, in, in the cinema. And I, I, television is better these days. And not to knock television, because I watch plenty of that, too, because many, many people who started out, say, DPs, uh, you see ASC after a lot of names of people shooting uh, HBO and series that are on stars and series that are on uh, you know Showtime and that kind of thing. But the truth is, in cinemas at film festivals, and very possibly in the near future across the internet as the distribution spreads, uh, DIY distribution spreads. I see such creativity, and it's. I have to lay it at the doorstep of the of the digital revolution. It's really not only opened the doors to a lot of people, but it's also opened wider doors to what we can do. There's so much. I happen to be one of those people. I love not only shooting, but I love color correcting, and I love going in and compositing, and I love seeing how plastic I can make the image. And, and, and every time I do that, the image teaches me something. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming out to uh, Hollywood. Have a, You're going back to New York or where are you going? Tomorrow morning. Flying back out? Flying back out. Well, thank you for taking some time uh, to come down to uh, Hot Rod Cameras and talk to us about uh, all this stuff. <laughs> it's kind of a brain full. I wish I could talk to you all night. Hey, you're, you're quite welcome. All right, so that was David Leitner. David, please come back and talk to us about Final Cut Pro 10. I would really enjoy watching that. Yeah, and we should do it with. Um, well, that might be a vi- maybe we should do a video podcast for that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. Well, actually, I prefer audio because I'd like to have like brass knuckles or something. But maybe that would be good on video. <laughs> well, I don't know if David wants to do video though. Too something I've, I found is that uh, definitely having a microphone versus having a camera. There's a mm. you know, it's it's. It, I'm not a video podcast consumer. I, I know That's they true. I know they exist. I like listening to podcasts while I'm walking my dogs or taking a bike ride or driving around or whatever. That's true. And it's really hard to watch a video podcast in your car. And I'm always listening to podcasts in the car. Yeah, so. that's that's uh, yeah. So anyway, so that was that was uh, David Leitner. Awesome. Awesome interview. It was very enlightening. Very smart guy. So uh, who's our war story today? Our war story today is from Jendra Jarnigan. Yeah, you might know her. because She's the cinematographer who kind of had the Rosie the Riveter. Uh, I saw her on the cover of Filmmaker Magazine, I think, recently. She was the poster child for Local 600 for a while. She, yeah, yeah they, they've uh, adopted her Rosie the Riveter do-rag uh, Harry <laughs> 235. She basically, she did this photograph of herself done up as Rosie the Riveter with a camera uh, in... Well, actually, doesn't she tell the story? I don't. She does tell the story. So, in the you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ruin her. Don't story ruin her for, story, for, Ilya. For the next well, let's uh, podcast, just, let's, let's just get to her war story. Uh, without further ado, this is Gendra's war story. And now, war stories. Sundance 2006. My roommates invite me to a house party uh, for a friend of theirs, a friend that I do not know. And this friend turns out to be Mark Peterson, who I've come to know over the years. And I find myself in the kitchen talking to a guy about film versus HD. He's like, oh, you're a DP and do you shoot HD? And I said, I try not to. And he asked why not? And I said all the things that were wrong with HD and what were lacking and why film was better and why no DP would ever want to shoot HD what about this camera and what about that camera and kept up with the conversation and I knew everything about all the cameras and I was reading CML at the time and very informed and come to find out that this person is very impressed at how informed I am about all of the cameras and keeps the conversation going deeper and deeper and deeper. It's a very intense and interesting conversation that you can sometimes find yourself in in a 
at a house party at Sundance. So the conversation goes on, and he asks me, if you could conceive of any camera, don't even worry about what's possible or what exists right now, like what would you want? What would you want in a camera if you could just invent one from scratch? And at the time, I said all the things that we would want in a digital cinema camera that at that time did not yet exist, like a 35 millimeter size sensor that would take PL mount lenses and extended dynamic range and high resolution and good colors and, you know, all the things that we want in a camera, a camera that doesn't exist in 2006. Apparently, I gave him all the right answers. And then he tells me that his name is Ted Shilowitz and that he wants to share a secret with me. He brings me into a bedroom <laughs> in a condo. He's like, come with me. And we walk by Mark, whose house it is, the host of the party, and he says to Mark, I'm bringing her in. He's like, I'm gonna give you a gift. And he gives me a t-shirt. And the t-shirt says, Red Digital Cinema. That means nothing to anybody at that point. And he says, I want you to join our team. A few months later, I am working at Red's booth at NAB as the resident DP explaining what is this camera that doesn't exist and what is it going to be and how is it different than everything else that exists. From that point forward, I ride this wave of technology and knowledge and image science and get a lot of attention for being very in the know on the cutting edge of digital cinema and emerging cameras. And I get flown out to be on panels and to teach workshops and give presentations and basically become this camera nerd, uh, this digital cinema nerd, which was fun for a little while. And, and I was convinced that this was a way for me to distinguish myself, raising my profile and becoming well known, that I know all this stuff, that people are gonna hire me because I know this stuff before anybody else does. The next thing I know, I'm spending all of my time learning about every single camera and every single person's opinion about this camera and why this is better. I'm being viewed as this digital cinema expert. And I'm thinking this is a good way to position myself to get jobs and to get hired because I know this stuff before other people do. So I'm geeking out with another camera nerd, another DP who also happens to be very technical. And we're having a conversation and in all seriousness, the words come out of my mouth, the MTF of the OLPF. And I stop myself, and we both laugh. What have I become that those words just came out of my mouth? What are we talking about and why, and this is ridiculous, So it took this really extreme nerdgasm <laughs> for me to realize that this is not who I wanted to become. This is not what I meant to be. I don't care about pixels. I care about art. Like I became a DP because I want to create beauty, not because I want to sit here impressing people with how smart I am. Like that's bullshit. That to me was like the moment when I realized how off track I was and, and how I rededicated myself to becoming an artist and getting comfortable calling myself an artist. All right, so uh, we should look forward to that uh, Jendra Jarnigan interview very soon. As soon as we do, as soon as we interview someone else, because we've officially hit the end, <laughs> so we have to have someone else for the war story. We've got other people in the queue. That's true. Also, you know, I still have Jason Wingrove's war story that has never aired. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> true story. <laughs> ah, that's right, because we yeah. didn't, we weren't able to tease it. So yeah, we're, yeah. we're going to end up with an extra interview and missing a war story, and somehow we'll. we'll uh, I thought that I thought that we could just do an all war story interview one day. I have an excellent war story. Oh, so. you and me both, brother. Yeah. I got a lot of war stories. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and it's one that I, I don't mind sharing. And I'll name names. It'll be good. It'll be I, a good I, story. I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll name names, some names. Uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't look so sure. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, what is your short end? What is your obsession of the week? 
Uh, my obsession this week is probably unmanned aerial vehicles. Drones. Drones, yes. Uh, specifically being used for aerial cinematography. I was uh, very hesitant and very reticent of these uh, flying contraptions uh, a year ago when I had customers coming into my shop saying, hey, I built this thing in my garage and I took your camera and I strapped it on the belly and look at these cool shots. I, like I remember that. going to NAB, I think it was two years ago, and every third booth had like some kind of helicopter cam of some kind. Yes, they did. And I got to say that I felt like it was not a very mature technology. I felt like at that point there was very much the hobby shop crowd where the people yeah. who were doing this, it was not cinematographers. It was not the, um, I'd say working usual run of the mill camera guy. Yeah. And I see that changing now. I see more and more people who were essentially considering themselves either a DP or a camera operator and now investing in aerial cinematography tools, particularly like octocopters and son of a bitch does that mean i have to buy a fucking drone now uh. you don't have to but i will tell you that it's a lot of fun and that the people who are doing this who are doing it safely and doing it right are few and far between most of the people kind of through i mean hell it's like you know the big box retailers sell all the they sell yeah. these drone things and there's all these warnings that say like yeah don't don't be an idiot when you fly this thing and oh and by the way it doesn't come with batteries or half the things you need to actually make it work you really got to find a shop that knows how to make these things work and put it all together or you have to educate yourself to do yeah. it all yourself and i think for a lot of camera guys out there spending their time in their garage soldering you know components mm-hmm. together and you know figuring mm-hmm. out switches and no. i mean none of this stuff is is fun so yeah. one of the things that here it is it's the thinly veiled commercial for hot rod cameras. oh no yes uh, one of the things we're going to be launching in the next couple of months so to speak so to speak. Well, it's going to be launching off the ground. Never mind. Go on. <laughs> the uh, aerial cinematography store inside of Hot Rod Cameras. Aren't where you going to break the ceiling? We we will have to do it outside. Oh, yeah. damn it. Yes. Uh, doing it inside is loud and windy and dangerous. Yeah. We'll do it outside. Yeah, but, yeah. But the point is um, turnkey, ready to go, ready to fly vehicles, complete with training so people know how to operate them safely and effectively and uh, not having to go through a whole lot of the, um, hey, solder connector A to Ugh. wire B and all the other sort of uh, nuisances of like, wow, how do I understand? I see the black and white cable commercial. You hate soldering your drones like <laughs> a, a, like a guy in a Hawaiian shirt in black and white, like with that like Ugh, look on his face, you know, like. There's a lot of things even even worse than the soldering, but the troubleshooting that goes into it and the training aspects, we're going to take a lot of that pain away for people and really make it so, hey, I want to do this. This is a powerful tool. I want to do it smart and safely. You can come to one place, purchase something that actually works when you get it, and you feel very happy about it and not feel like you were just sold a bill of goods. Yeah. And you've got something here now. You got to figure it all out. Otherwise, you're never going to get your money out of it. I know. I know a few people who like went and bought those drones and then just don't use them. Although my friend Dan Myrick, he bought one like a year ago. And I, I think I am surprised when I don't see him with the drone. Like, it's just the most important thing. He, I think he likes it better than his wife and kids. Oh, man, that's terrible. I'm so sorry yeah. to, to hear that. But he was like, yeah, you don't need a dolly anymore, man. You can just put the camera right on this drone and just have it move. I'm like. But what if I don't want to... <sighs> There's some real problems with, with thinking that is a substitute for a doctor. I don't think, in, so. in all fairness, I don't think Dan really feels that way. I, I He probably does not feel that way. But I'm just saying, like, there are some people out there who think, oh, we'll start with a dolly, we'll zip up to the sky, we'll come back down, and it's not exactly like it's that. neat if it tells the story that's great it's it's like steady i had this conversation with someone about steadicam they were asking me if i knew any good steadicam operators and it occurred to me that i actually don't really know i know people who would know good steadicam operators i know some guys like rich davis and charles pappert who are like high high-end steadicam operators and also dps but i don't know anyone who's like steadicam that caters to the indie set and i think it's because there's i mean it might just be me but i think that not a lot of indie films are thinking like oh cool i'll have a steadicam for that i think a lot of indie films don't th- understand the power of steadicam and that they're interested in unmotivated camera moves or yeah. they're interested in you know uh the most sort of hack cinematography that might be out there and so the people who specialize in those you know low end low low end steadicam yeah. sort of shows uh i mean i'm really not bit, i'm not saying anything negative about St- steadicam is awesome it's just one possible way to move the camera it is and i think that um it's a very refined and disciplined and 
the way to do it. And the people who do it have a lot of practice and experience and, and time invested in honing, and, and honing in, their craft. And in my experience, and this is just my limited experience when I've worked with Steadicam, is that you maybe think it's going to save you time, but it, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It's like anything else. It's like you got to take the, if you only have one camera body and you have to put it on there and counterweight it, it's going to take some time. If you have two camera bodies and it can be ready to go with the lens that you need and everything, because anything that changes the weight or the distribution of the weight changes the counterbalancing. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's an art, it, you know, it's an art and a science and it's really hard to do well. And, uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. That's, that's a different conversation about you know, Steadicam. We, we can talk about Steadicams and gimbals and all these sort of like new tools and, and in the next episode, if maybe like in the Gendry episode, we'll, we'll talk about how, ways we can move cameras around. That might be a fun I, thing. I think it's a great idea. We'll even talk about sliders. I love my slider to death. Anyway, they're like these little hamburgers. I love them so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, yes. So anyway, there's lots of tools and it seems to me that people don't really get tired of talking about it or hearing about it. So, yeah, we, we might as well do an episode. OK, Ben, what is your short end this week? My short end is Fantastic Fest, uh, which I believe personally is the best film festival I've ever personally attended. I don't know if I can be there this year, which is sad. It's September 18th through the 25th in Austin, Texas, uh, at the Alamo Draft House, And actually, the, my feature film, Alien Raiders, premiered there uh, in 2008. I, I was able to go there once after that because uh, Alicia, my wife, had a, had a short film that played there as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never been to a film festival that was like so hands-on with filmmakers and film fans and, you know, with cool activities. Tim League, who runs Fantastic Fest, who owns the Alamo Draft House, who started... Uh, Draft House Films, which is now releasing a lot of these more idiosyncratic movies. Mm. I think Tim League is a freaking genius. They, he really knows. He really ha- has a strong stranglehold on the on the on the mindset of the genre fan. Hmm. And so, you know, you might say, "Well, I'm not a horror fan." Well, they have animation, they have fantasy, they have kung fu movies. The year the year my film played there, science fiction. They do have tons of science fiction. The year my film was there, uh, there was a documentary called Not Quite Hollywood about Australian exploitation movies, which wow. I think I think it's on Netflix. And like, I can't believe how much I learned <laughs> at, at, at Fantastic Fest. I saw movies like Let the Right One In for the first time mm-hmm. ever there. Um, and, and it's just kind of like an amazing nexus. I, and I've been to a lot of film festivals and I've worked at some film festivals. And I think I think Fantastic Fest does it right. And if you have any inclination to uh, like genre films and you can get your ass to uh, Austin, Texas in September, you should plan, start planning now and go if you can. How does it compare to South by Southwest, which is to me the, the obvious question just because they're in the same city. Well, uh, I'm saying this out of pure ignorance because I've never been to South by Southwest. What, what I've always heard about South by Southwest is that it's awesome, but it's kind of a zoo. That's uh, an accurate description. Fantastic Fest was not a zoo. I in the in the times that I've been to Fantastic Fest, it's never been a zoo. It's always been like uh, I remember one person saying that like Sundance is like going to a museum, and Fantastic Fest is like going to a barbecue. <laughs> and well, that's the right city for it. <laughs> yeah, for real. One of the things that I think is missing, especially in the YouTube era, is a sense of curation. Mm. Uh, and, uh, yeah, cause like any schmo can just make, you know, shoot their ass crack for a half an hour and upload it onto YouTube and get a million hits. And you're like, why did this guy's ass crack? Why, why did another video of kittens on a Roomba get a million hits? Have we not seen enough kittens ass on a Roomba? crack 45 is my favorite half hour video. <laughs> it is pretty good. It's, it's hypnotic what he does with his ass crack or might've been hers. I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't it was too close. To tell. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's, just, part, it's part of the mystery yeah. of the ass crack 45. But, uh, you know, when you go, when you go to, uh, Fantastic yeah, the, Fest, you get a sense of, of just amazing curation of uh, curation by people who love genre. There's a love that's put into the way that the festival is programmed. Mm. And, uh, you know, they bring filmmakers out who just who are excited about about presenting their work to an audience and getting immediate audience feedback. And nine times out of ten, you can walk right up to the filmmaker and talk to them. When I was a filmmaker there, I was you could walk up and talk to me because I was I spent most of my time just watching other films. Mm. Um, and it was, to me, it's just one of the most brilliant, uh, things. And they just reopened, um, the South Lamar venue, uh, for the Alamo draft house. 
and uh, that was that was where we premiered. And I thought it was a great venue, and also the Highball, which is like a bar that everyone goes and hangs out at. I have no affiliation with them. I just think they're awesome. It, well, that's a that's a great endorsement. Now, can you tell like when you're in Austin during Fantastic Fest that like a film festival is going on? Is the no. street shut down? Is no, it like, it's not. Yeah. When I've been there, it's not been zoo like like that. I will say that when uh, like the opening night of Fantastic Fest, which they did. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot myself. I don't remember the name of the venue. It was in downtown Austin Mm. and it was a beautiful old theater. Mm. And I mean, there was a little bit of a zoo outside, but no more than you would see for like a concert. Um, the opening night film I think was uh, gentlemen Broncos that year. They also had, uh, the George Romero, um, survival of the dead movie, which, uh, was so much fun to see there to be surrounded in kind of an orgy of, uh, of genre lovers, to me is to me there's nothing more fun than that and it wasn't just about like people being excited about my film it was about people being excited uh, people being unrestrainedly excited about genre at a film festival setting and i and again my hats off to tim league for doing uh, what he's done with that festival it's it's really amazing <laughs> I think that just about does it. We're going to have to leave it there. Ben, that, that does sound amazing. I will totally try to get to a fantastic fest if I, if I at all possible can. I cannot go either. I will be at Cynic, which is a work thing in, yeah. in Munich, Germany, where Oktoberfest is also going on. So oh, be, so, so you'll be there drink, so, drinking so I'll, beer I'll, and eating I'll food. i drunk, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, hey, uh, that's it for this episode. Let's, uh, let's sing a song to... <laughs> cinematography (laughs) podcast (laughs) yay so that's it for uh, episode five join us hopefully soon for episode six we got episode five out in a decent time frame we did it was quick it's like three weeks yeah yeah and now we're uh, we're basically with gendra we're out of all the dps who we've interviewed so anyone moving forward is going to be brand new uh so so Ilya, how can people reach us if they'd like to find out more about us people can reach us at email at cinematographypodcast.com and are we on the Twitters? We are on the Twitters at at short ends with a Z. And we can also be found on iTunes, correct? We can also be found on iTunes. So please go to iTunes, give us a thumbs up, write us a review. If you hate us, write a review. I'll take a, I'll take a bad review. I can take criticism. I want to make this a great podcast. I can't take criticism. Well, that's, you know. I, I'm fragile. and uh, I'll, uh, I'll shield you. Okay, thanks. I just, just, you know, when the bad reviews come in, I will <laughs> tell All <me>. right. <laughs> and uh, I'm on Twitter at Neptune Salad. And you can also find out everything you need to know about me at www.benrockonline.com. We'd like to thank Kay's Alatrachi once again for composing all of the music that is used in the cinematography podcast. Thanks, Kays. Please uh, go to www.musicbykays.com and hire Kays and pay him well. He's got two dogs that need to be fed and they eat a lot. They do. They're big. Big dogs. Thank you very much. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.